Hello, my fellow Kaletsakin liver grillers. I'm here today to talk to you about uh, another in the line of videos that has seems to have uh, captured the attention of a wider audience. And very gladly, on, on my part, I'm still very grateful for all the attention. And many people have raised a variety of, let's say, questions, even if they're put in the form of statements of fact. But I, I'll, I'll just to address it as the form of a question as to relates the indigeneity of the Jewish people to the land of Canaan or Palestine, as you prefer, with, with regards to the kingdom of Israel. I think it's important to distinguish the kingdom of Israel uh, of the uh, Iron Age from the modern day state of Israel as two separate entities. I think far too many people conflate them, but I don't think any person who, uh, who would be worth their salt in sort of like a debate should really conflate them as a point of academic and honest discourse being as they are separated by a distance of about 3,000, uh, two and a half to 3,000 years in uh, time frame. But I do think it's a worthy question, as I am particularly interested in this particular era in history, maybe not quite as much as the Bronze Age. But the Iron Age, I feel like, the context of the Bronze Age has a whole lot to explain what we know about the Iron Age through archaeology. And I would be eager to get into it. The subject of today's video is titled <laughs> Why the Ancient Kingdom of Israel is not, was not Jewish. And why we know. This uh, may be, seems like a belligerent question, but this is really hardly a belligerent question or, or really a very controversial question among archaeologists or historians who, who sort of like take the archaeology very seriously. They might argue that there was an undercurrent of Judaism as a class in the kingdom of Israel, as like, or the antecedents of Judaism in the kingdom of Israel and Judah, but uh, among a Yahwist population, but as in a broader sense, uh, Judaism as we know it today didn't exist in ancient Israel, and here's why. And I think this is an important question to sort of answer for a lot of people, because for a lot of people, their understanding of the history of the Near East and particularly the Levant, is colored not just by the Bible, but through exegesis of the Bible, whether they're personal exegesis or their pastors or rabbis or whomsoever may be interpreting this from a modern theological perspective rather than a historical perspective. And I, and I, I wish to address kind of like the historical perspective. People may have different opinions than me, and this is perfectly valid in, in as much as the sphere of like religion and, you know, personal beliefs. But when we're talking about politics, as in like the lives of people in the present day and the justification of any action taken in the present day on the basis of history, we must endeavor to use instead real history rather than uh, theological personal interpretation. And I, like, with, that, with that disclaimer get, got out of the way, we, we should kind of first define what, what I think of as a Jew, or, or, or more specifically, a practitioner of the Jewish religion in this context, as separated from practitioners of polytheistic religion, or, or, or any other religion, you know, Jews as separated from Gentiles in terms of religion, not in terms of ethnicity. That is, a, is like a wholly other matter. We're focusing today 
on the question of Judaism and whether Jews existed or were the majority in the uh, United Kingdom of Israel or in either or of the divided kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And to begin, we should, we should sort of like, I would say it would not upset very many rabbis to argue that there are certain conditions to be met before someone could be continue, considered Jewish in a religious sense. I think the primary one, and one of the ones that is most likely an argument could be rested on in this particular case is the question of monotheism. Monotheism is a foundational belief for the religious practice of Judaism, as understood by virtually all rabbis from antiquity to today. If you're not a monotheist, you're not Jewish. And in, in a religious sense, you may be uh, Jewish in a cultural sense or an ethnic sense or any other sense, but from a religious sense, you are not Jewish unless you are a monotheist. I think secondarily, and this is a part in which there is a greater degree of dispute, is Judaism can be sort of understood as following or at least recognizing the laws and commandments of Moses in Tanakh, which is the Ten Commandments plus the 614 other, you know, little rules that the Jews are meant to follow that, that amount to the, the basis of Jewish life. Now, not every single commandment is relevant to every particular period in Jewish history. A great many of them kind of have a reliance on certain material conditions being met for their practice. So they are sort of abrogated by historical events. Secondarily, there is the other issue of uh, the uh, reform Jewish religion uh, and conservative traditions that, let, let's say, they, they don't always consistently uh, adhere or necessarily even profess to argue for the practice of every aspect of uh, Tanakhic law or Halakhic law. And this, this is certainly uh, something that, that is, is valid. Uh, I guess it's on, on the edge of being debatable within the Jewish community. I would say that following the laws of Moses consistently would be a tell of someone being Jewish along with uh, following the admonitions of the Talmud, which is the oral Torah, which is the, the varieties of sayings and affirmations and commentary on Torah and Tanakh that uh, the Jews hold to, uh, but not all Jews, uh, as, as is quite... Like, the Karaite community does not hold to following the oral Torah, instead relying on a personal interpretation of the Torah, much the same as Salafis sometimes reject the, uh, the, the requirement of following the jurisprudence of the five Sunni schools, or even universally accepting everything in Sunnah as, as necessary to interpret Quran. This, this sort of undercurrent also exists in Judaism, even though it's significantly smaller. The, the, I would say the Karaite community probably cons consists of less than a percent of Jews worldwide. But it's not a, like a groundbreaking, it's not a defining feature. You can, you can ignore oral Torah and still be put in the category of Jewish. But, of course, it would be a significant, you know, tell if one were to follow oral Torah and the admonitions of the Babylonian Talmud and all these other Jewish 
uh, commentaries and exegesis that, that kind of came out of it. Maimonides, Nachmanides, and the Kabbalistic texts. These are all tales of Judaism, but they're not defining traits of Judaism. One can be completely Jewish while utterly disregarding these, these texts. And there are those who instead, like, you know, they, they, they seek out details in these texts, yet do not embody the Jewish religion. Okay. Now, with that defined, and with 10 minutes into my video, even defining what the problem is and defining what a Jew is, you can kind of see a certain degree of, like, the, the difficulty of, of determining what an antiquity would consider, would be, how we can consider these, these people who lived 3,000 to 2,500 years ago as being Jewish or not. But I, I don't think this is terribly difficult, because it kind of fa fails on... A, a very simple basis that being the question of polytheism the prevalence of polytheism in the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah both the unified kingdom and the disunified monarchy that's the, the two kingdom system that they had even in the Bible indicates that it was a very prevalent undercurrent of polytheism, even by the standards of the later biblical writers, that they were aware that a substantial portion of the population, if not the majority, because obviously, statistically, they cannot really enumerate this population, but a significant portion of the population was polytheistic. And this particular fact has kind of been borne out through archaeology. There have been many inscriptions from, you know, the land of Palestine, which attribute to Yahweh partners like the wife Asherah or Anat that are in line with Canaanite religious practices as, as Yahweh existing as a part of a Canaanite pantheon, as a supreme deity in a Canaanite pantheon, but very, very little difference in terms of his position in their particular state, in their particular society and religion, as a national deity might be, as for Qaus or Hamosh, or any of these, these deities from Moab or Edom or Ammon or Milkart in Tyre or Hadad in Damascus or in Syria more generally or Tushpa in the Neo-Hittite states, in the Iron Age, and Ashur in Assyria, that in, in general, in the Semitic world, in the Iron Age, there seems to have been a certain tradition, not of monotheism, but to sort of focus one's religious energies to a kind of henotheism, or like a state god. This wasn't to deny the the worship or the practices of a variety pan, a variety uh, pantheon but but rather to more specifically consolidate worship of the state around a particular deity sort of like a state god and this this is sort of sort of you see this all throughout antiquity in classical antiquity of states and cities having their patron deity the one of some famous ones including athena of athens or marduk of babylon ashur of assyria and yahweh essentially has been shown to have figured in in as much in the israelite uh, interpretation of canaanite religion and why is this uh, significant I guess because the Israelites or, you know, the, the ruling elite of the state of Israel would, consist, would constitute the people historically that would undergo the exile. When the Assyrians took Samaria and later the Babylonians captured Jerusalem, there was a period of exile for 
these two Israelite communities. And following this ambiguous period, or perhaps under-researched period, they underwent a transformation from uh, having the same material culture and the same polytheistic beliefs as born by the vast array of polytheistic cult practices like Judean pillar figurines, inscriptions, altars, etc., high places in the Iron Age in Israelite sites just the same as their Canaanite and Philistine and Aramean neighbors. After this point, the Sumerians and the Judahites elite seem to have come back after the exile or, or within the exile themselves developed a certain idea of monotheism. And because this period is, is actually kind of understudied and, and, and very much ambiguous, left ambiguous almost intentionally by religiously motivated archaeologists, I would think, or just like the, the reality of funding and the difficulties, in, I guess, of excavating in Iraq and th th this and just like this, the dearth actually of information about the Persian period in general, perhaps as a result of Alexander's burning of the libraries and records at Persepolis, this, this area has just kind of not been fully explored. But from what we know, uh, this appears to have been a time of greater consolidation of worship into fewer and fewer deities, even outside of the Hebrew context. We can, we can talk about, you know, the Zoroastrian tradition, which had its own ambiguous origins, but was well attested as being practically monotheistic or more dualistic by the time the Achaemenid Empire sort of enters the scene and like with its textual uh, records with the way that uh, Cyrus records his exploits and Darius records his exploits as being uh, sort of made possible by their supreme deity, Ahur Mazda. And it seems very clear that a lot of concepts from within Zoroastrianism have become prevalent in the Hebraic uh, religion. The concept of duality is, is obviously very present in modern day Judaism and especially in Christianity, which actually the earlier Judaism sh shared many, many more uh, points of similarity as well. Like the duality of heaven and hell, God and the devil, this did not at all exist. Uh, is, or at least has not been shown to exist in any text prior to uh, the Persian period. And the, the, the Persian influence on Judaism is, is definitely, and the Babylonian influence is definitely not neglected by Jewish scholars. This is definitely well attested even by, by many Jewish scholars. I will say that like this is kind of a settled historical question to a certain extent and I'm I'm more just educating people on how we know these things from from the uh, material remains from text text <laughs> text text you know like uh from the lands of Canaan and also from Egypt as well but an interesting case is the temple of Yahweh in the island of Elephantine in Egypt, or more, I think it's near the border with Sudan. But this island actually had a Hebrew temple uh, supported by a Hebrew mercenary community in Egypt near the Nubian border, where they worshipped Yahweh along uh, alongside other gods. And records of this are actually much better preserved uh, by virtue of, you know, the, the methods of writing that Egypt had, secondarily also the environmental factors that lead to greater preservation of texts on perishable materials that 
have has been the greatest boon for Egyptology. The the advantage Egyptologists have is that the odds due to the climate of Egypt, the odds of an item or or a text written on a perishable material like uh, parchment or papyrus or cloth is just so much higher that we have so much more records from Egypt than in areas in which are more consistently damp, let's say. Obviously, Egypt has the Nile and it's quite humid in that particular area, but there were also plenty of places in which the uh, sources of text were geographically removed from the Nile to the extent that the dry air preserved text to a much greater degree than would otherwise occur. So now we kind of know like that the Israelite religion does not seem to bear any significant uh, difference from the Canaanite religion. That there are many points in this. You can actually go through and pick through like verses in the Bible, in, in Tanakh, that almost identically mirror uh, Canaanite, Babylonian, and Egyptian texts that would have been all but, you know, ubiquitous throughout the ancient world. The most famous one, I think, being the plagiarism of the story of Ziusudra or Utnapishtim into the Hebrew canon as the story of Noah. Or the Babylonian creation myth, uh, Enuma Elish, kind of being subsumed into one of the two Genesis narratives. But of course, like, you know, influence does not necessarily imply a lack of distinctiveness. And in many cases, archaeologists are trying to look for signs of any sort of adherence to Mosaic law to distinguish a site that is Israelite from a site that is Canaanite for a variety of reasons. And of course, all of these are necessarily fraught with issues. One of the uh, very typical means that they have historically used to label a site Israelite rather than Canaanite or Philistine is the prevalence or lack of the bones of swine or pigs, you know, those oinkers, you know. Of course, I, I, don't, I don't think this is, is significant, uh, a significant indication. First of all, sites that have been labeled as Israelite have these bones, but they are sort of, they have the quantity of these bones in a smaller fashion. And this is ignoring the broader historical context of the entire Near East and the broader development of Near Eastern cultures in the, in the wide scale. The prevalence of the symbolism of a shepherd goes quite a long ba way back before there was even such a thing as Israelites. Rather that this is very much an Amorite addition to the propagandistic vocabulary of the Near East. In the Sumerian period, kings would be loath to describe themselves as uh, farmers because the idea of elite culture was urban, the urban priest. The king should represent himself as performing tasks specific to city dwelling. And in this period, pork was absolutely consumed without a particular taboo against it. You see pork referred to frequently in Sumerian and earlier Akkadian sources as a common source of protein due to its convenient uh, status in, in cities as, as a use of transforming waste into into flesh, you know, transforming waste into food. But in about the 19th and 20th centuries BCE, 
a new migration of people enters into Mesopotamia and Syria and Palestine, or at least makes itself more culturally relevant, and that would be the Amorites. And the Amorites were distinguished in antiquity, particularly by their shepherding nature. They were, they were nomadic pastoral herders, and their particular food was very much what we would see as similar to the stereotypical uh, Hebrew diet with, you know, or, or even Islamic diet. It would be goats, sheep, cattle. Uh, these kind of animals were, were much more prevalent. And as a result of Amorite dominance over centuries, there was sort of like an Amorite golden age in Mesopotamia and Syria, and presumably also in Palestine, although the written records from the Middle Bronze Age are much, much more scarce in that particular area. They had engendered centuries and centuries of political domination that reframed the way that ancient Near Eastern royalty sort of saw the symbols of their power. So the symbol of power for royalty would become the shepherd, the keeper of sheep. His uh, military role was increased and his religious role was kind of walked back. Certainly the Amorite king still had a religious role, but the role of a king as a priest is kind of more segregated and, and more isolated from one another. And this is, is something you also, this is something that affects, you know, the taboos with food. When a prestige group kind of does not enjoy a particular type of food, it, this can easily pass into the territory of becoming taboo. You can see this with the consumption of, of dog meat. In ancient Hawaii, dog meat was actually reserved for the, the highest elite but once the social systems in the Polynesian islands were upset by European colonization and a new elite, a European elite who thought less of eating dog uh, sort of emerged, they kind of threw away, you know, this, this part of their culture and it became taboo just as with the rest. So this is, this is sort of what you see more broadly in the Near East is that pork consumption among all Near Eastern people precipitously dropped even before the late Bronze Age and the Iron Age in which we sort of attribute certain sites as Israelite. Perhaps one might say that a lack of swine uh, in a site may be a sign of like uh, lesser degrees of sedentarism. Less swine means you are more relying on pastoral ways of life, less uh, on grain, and more on the produce of shepherds, you know, as in like dairy and meat. But it does not really make, I think, any significant statements about uh, a person's religion that their diet is, is thus. And you can very clearly, clearly see it on the coast, more pork, inland, moderate quantities of pork, far inland, nearly no pork. And this was more due to the environment and to social taboos that were more universal rather than simply, you know, any sort of religious, specific religious designation. I just, you know, thought to explain this. Maybe next week we can sort of talk about uh, where the Jews, as like the Jewish religion actually comes from. Because uh, that I think it's a very interesting topic to talk about in depth. All right. Well, oh, to leave with an emotional aside... As, as the Israelites 
or what we designate as Israelites, were just Canaanites. They were a variety of Canaanites or a regional ethnic group of Canaanites. It is true to say that the Palestinians are every bit the descendants of these people as they are the descendants of all the different groups that have come to find a home in the southern Levant and in Palestine. And I think, I think to say otherwise or to say that it, it, it is kind of silly. Or, or rather, if you care about who is an indigenous on the basis of ancient Israel, then all the more you should support Palestinians from having their land stolen from the genocide that, that's taking place against them if you actually consider who is the descendant of Israelites very, very significant. Anyway, uh, ball bless you all, and uh, go out there and do something.